Hey everyone, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. Okay, so today I'm going to share an amazing image of the Markarian galaxy chain, which I captured with my Astrotech 115 EDT refractor on the 20th of February, 2024. This is a beautiful image of a stunning astronomical scene. And uh, we're going to really focus on the objects in the frame more so than, let's say, the technicals behind how I captured and processed. I will mention that in the video, throughout the video, and I'll even, towards the end of the video, give a summary for those who are interested in the technicals. But I really think this is has to be about uh, touring the objects in this frame. And um, to do that, I'm going to start first with a little bit of perspective on the universe and the hierarchy of uh, of our um, of our universe because it's absolutely mind-boggling, and then what we'll do is we'll 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 focus in on the various galaxies that are in this frame, and we'll learn a little bit about about them, and then finally, like I said, I'll I'll give a little brief uh, uh, summary of how I captured this image using my telescope and what processing techniques I applied. Very simple, and it, you probably know by now that I I am as uh, interested in the objects that I'm capturing as I am the processing. I'm, in fact, I might even be more interested in learning about the objects that we're, we're capturing with our cameras than I am about the techniques behind it. But having said that, I, I, I respect everybody's appreciation of this hobby and everybody likes something different about it. It's a very challenging hobby. And, and uh, if I can share some stuff that's helpful, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And with that, if you are into astronomy and all things astrophotography, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, there's a lot of good content coming out on this channel. I try to produce a video at least once a week, often twice a week. We've got a great community forming here, and uh, I, think you, I, I think you'll like what we have to offer. And for those that have subscribed, thank you so much. I, I, I really do appreciate the likes and the comments. It's part of the motivation that keeps me sharing uh, this field of work. And with that, let's get some perspective. So the other night I was at a family dinner. We were celebrating my father's birthday. And my youngest brother, my younger brother, said to me that he was contemplating infinity and was having a hard time getting his head wrapped around the concept. And I laughed and I said, don't even try because this uh, infinity is not something to be resolved by, by definition. But uh, at the same time, his dilemma is one of the reasons why I love astronomy and astrophotography. And I think it's driven largely by this, the vastness of our universe and uh, this endless quest that we seem to be on to understand it and, and all of its unknowns. And so the scientists have identified or let's say assigned a hierarchy to the structure of the known universe, uh, which is simulated in this image, uh, which is courtesy of Andrew Colvin and Wikipedia. Uh, I say known because I think there's a recognition that anything beyond this 93 billion light year diameter is simply unknowable, uh, but it likely exists. So uh, this image illustrates at the, at, the, at the highest level the universal structure, and that being um, a web of dark matter that is kind of stranded together into what we call filaments. And the filaments are separated by voids of presumably empty space. So concentration of matter is happening in these filaments, in this web. And the Milky Way is represented dead center in this image, which really hammers home this infinite nature of the universe. And that's because no matter where you are in the universe with this model, you would be at the center right? Because it is infinity. And, and, and so at, and no matter where you are in the universe, you would experience this 93 billion light year di uh, diameter boundary of, uh, of observation. And it would be the same for all of us. So technically, um, the Earth is at the center of the universe. Okay, so now we can see galaxies uh, like the Milky Way do not exist in isolation. They're part of these filament complexes and they are found in, in, in these denser groupings or clusters and superclusters of galaxies. So when we look at this 2 billion light year diameter section of the universe, at the center we see a complex called the Nyakea. 
Uh, and that means immense heaven in Hawaiian. And it's also the host of the Virgo supercluster, among other superclusters that are represented here. Now, the Virgo supercluster contains about 100 other galaxy clusters and groupings. And we call it the local supercluster because our galaxy, the Milky Way, resides within it. And uh, um, th these galaxies in this supercluster and these clusters of galaxies start to become very observable and imageable with home telescopes, especially if we get into the sub 100 million light year range. There are lots of great targets here, uh, M81, M101, M51, all terrific targets, as well as the Virgo cluster itself. And uh, whose center, the center of that cluster, is roughly 65 million light years from, from the Milky Way. And uh, we are part of something called the local group of galaxies. The Milky Way is part of that. In fact, if we zoom down to 10 million light year radius, we can see the entire local group of galaxies. And most famously, of course, there's Andromeda, which is a really good sized spiral galaxy. It's about 150 to 200,000 light years in diameter. And um, it's about 2.5 million light years away. But it can be seen with the naked eye under the right conditions. And uh, it's a little smudge in the sky. You kind of have to avert your vision to see it. But um, it's always fun to, to do. And that smudge is the glow of about a trillion stars. So that gives you a little bit of perspective about what one galaxy uh, uh, is made up of, let alone groups of galaxies clusters of galaxies, super clusters, and then these large complexes and these filaments that run throughout the universe. So, um, you know, th there's a lot to observe in our local galaxy group, but for this video, we're going to actually focus on the Virgo cluster, specifically the Markarian's chain of galaxies. Okay, so the image of the Virgo cluster that I've shared so far in this video was taken by Chris Mijos and his colleagues at Case Western University, and they used this modified Burl Schmidt telescope, which features a 24-inch aperture. This is a big telescope, and it's used today even uh, in, uh, in galactic research, and it produces some uh, pretty impressive images. Now, here's my image taken with the AstroTech 115 EDT, which has an aperture of about 4.5 inches, uh, significantly smaller. I share this not to not to knock the 24-inch aperture because that would be ridiculous. Rather, I, I, I share this because the universe is really accessible to us all, even with consumer-grade small home telescopes. Now, the Markarian chain is a prominent feature within the Virgo cluster, and it's situated about 50 million light years away from us. And uh, it's composed of a series of interacting galaxies um, that are visually strung together in a chain. Now, this image not only showcases this very dynamic display of you know, gravitational interactions, it also features a large number and a wide variety of ga galactic types. And um, when I turn on the annotations, we see that there are 26 identified galaxies here. And there are still many more that were undetected by the annotation software. So among the galaxies within the Markarian chain, several of them you'll notice are designated as Messier objects. These are M objects. They're cataloged. These were cataloged by the astronomer Charles Messier. This was in the 18th century. And, and most of the objects in the Messier catalog were, uh, were really considered to be nebulous or, you know, nebula objects. And... Um, and uh, at any rate, um, the, this image includes M84, M86, and M87. That's from the lower right, or obviously up to the upper left. And let's take a closer look at these specific galaxies, as well as a few others in the frame. And I'm going to start with M87, so we're going to shoot up to the top left of the image. And this is known as also, it's Virgo A, and this is a super giant elliptical galaxy. And it's, it's not part of the Markarian chain, but it's a very important galaxy, and I, intentional, I, I intentionally framed it in this capture. Um, this galaxy is the most massive galaxy in our local supercluster, and it has several trillion stars in it. And it, 
it appears small in Andromeda, the image of Andromeda that I shared with you before. And well, that's because this one's 53 million light years away, whereas Andromeda is only 2.5 million light years away. So um, M87 features about 15,000 globular star clusters. Um, uh, and, and this is a huge, huge number when you compare it to uh, the number of globs that we have in the Milky Way, which is probably around 150 to 200, and they, and they kind of sit on the outskirts of our galaxy. Now, around M87, you can see um, a number of satellite uh, galaxies, including some that aren't even annotated in this image. Um, it's likely that M87 formed through the consolidation of many of these satellite galaxies, and... Um, we know that M87 has a supermassive black hole at its center, and we know that because it has one of the strongest detected sources of radio waves. It's one of the strongest sources of radio waves. And, uh, and actually, in 2017, um, the Event Horizon Telescope directly imaged the event horizon of M87's uh, black hole, and uh, we got our very first visualization of a black hole's shadow. So now if we pan over to the opposite corner of this frame, we'll see M84 and M86. Now M84 is considered an elliptical, though recent Hubble for photographs kind of reveal that there's some evidence of a disk here. Um, however, there, there are no arms and there's very little star formation uh, going on in this galaxy. And that's the same exact thing applies to M86, um, which also is an elliptical that happens to be uh, rushing towards us. Um, and we know that because M86 is um, emitting a blue shift, as it, which is the opposite of a red shift. Blue shift happens when something is approaching you at speed, where red shift is what happens when something is receding. Now, ellipticals are, are mostly featureless spheres that are made up of uh, stars that are kind of tightly packed, older stars that are tightly packed together. And both of these galaxies, as I mentioned, uh, like M87, uh, likely absorb smaller dwarf galaxies um, as part of their formation. Now, these two galaxies also mark the start of the Markarian chain. And as we continue up this image and up the chain, we encounter a number of other galactic examples. Among my favorite, you know, NGC 4402, which is a spiral galaxy. And that means that it has a defined disk with distinct arms uh, that contain dust and, and the star forming materials in these star forming regions. However, NGC 4402 is kind of special in that most of its star forming material is actually stripped away from it through a process that we call ram pressure stripping. And, um, you know, so what's happening is NGC 4402 is actually falling into the center of the Virgo cluster itself. And as it does, the, the, the hot X-ray gases that are blowing out from, from Virgo's core and the, get, are blowing the material, the star-forming material, away from the NGC 4402 disk. And we can actually see this in the form of a bowing of, of uh, NGC 4402's disk. And uh, this is unbelievable to me that you can actually capture this phenomenon with a backyard telescope. And so the same phenomenon is ha happening to other galaxies, including NGC 4388, although the bulging disk is not as prominent. And look, just look at all the galaxies around the base of this chain. It's, each and every one is interesting in their own right. But why don't we just migrate up the chain a bit here, and let's check out what is called the, the eyes, or the eyes galaxies. And, and these are, this is a pair of interacting galaxies, NGC 4435 and NGC 4438. Now, clearly they're interacting. How do we know? Well, look at the fuzzy extensions between them, and particularly around NGC 4438. These are tidal tails, they're called, and they're due to gravitational forces between these two galaxies, as well as the cluster as a whole. It's kind of like ripping apart yeah, to some degree. I mean, it's a little bit of an experiment. No, it's not extreme. That's exactly what's happening. It's kind of tearing the galaxy's disk apart. And then there's one theory that postulates that perhaps um, these two galaxies had collided at some point, causing this extreme distortion in the disk. Now, if we, you know, if, if, if we go a little bit um, further up the chain, we see a similar pair of galaxies um, in NGC 4461 and in NGC 4458. So, 
uh, really, you know, just backing out and, and taking this image as a whole, there's so much to, there's so much to observe and appreciate in this image. And as I said, there are 26 annotated galaxies here. And I'd say there's at least 15 or 20 fainter galaxies that uh, when you when you look and zoom in, uh, you can detect. And I think this is a wonderful capture and another example of what you can do with a telescope in your own backyard. Um, you know, honestly, this object, uh, when, when I say this object, the chain itself and, and the Virgo cluster, you can easily image with shorter focal lengths and get a wider field of view. So like a 60 millimeter or an 80 millimeter refractor will do. But you can also use longer focal lengths on this, like an 8 inch or 8 to 12 inch, you know, schmidt Karzgren tel telescope. And that will allow you to kind of focus it in on any, you know, specific galaxy and or, you know, galaxy pairs. So, um, you know, with that, I, I, I really hope that you enjoyed uh, this, this view of uh, the Marca uh, Marcarian chain. And as promised, I'll give you a quick rundown on the uh, capture and uh, processing uh, workflow that I that I followed. Again, this image was shot on February 20th, 2024. It was uh, practically a full moon. I was using my AstroTech 115EDT um, refractor, and I paired that up with an ASI 2600mm uh, Pro camera. And I find that's a really good rig combination. And I used, uh, I actually only used um, RGB filters, so broadband filters. I didn't even shoot luminance data. And the sequence that I set up in Nina was for 30 exposures of 120 seconds each for each channel, R, G, and B. And I was at a gain of zero and an offset of 50, which I think works really well with that camera um, in, in broadband. So my stacking is always done with a uh, serial, and I and I of course have a a, a, a calibration library uh, which I use, which actually did not behave well uh, with this uh, w with these images on the on the twentieth, uh, likely because of the moon glow, and and I may have to refresh my library there. At any rate, uh, once stacked, I I pull those stacks, those linear stacks, into PixInsight for processing. And I keep it very simple, really. I, I, I'm, I'm all about the object itself and just getting it to a representation that allows me to tell a story. So I did an automatic background extraction, uh, stretch using the histogram tool, a little bit of curves processing. And then I took those uh, nonlinear images and used the uh, LRGB combination tool uh, to give me a uh, first color composition. And I think I threw a little bit of noise reduction on it. Um, and beyond that, uh, 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 it was ready to go. I probably tweaked a little bit of balance and uh, levels in, in GIMP. And then I just uh, you know, uh, s saved the image. So at any rate, it's really not a complicated target. And I, and I strongly encourage you uh, to go out there and get it. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's, uh, it's, it, as I said, it's, a, it's an image that can tell a great story. Okay, folks, let's call that a wrap on the video. I hope that this video demonstrated that even with a budget refractor, we can observe and image the same exact targets, uh, targets that research scientists are focused on. And uh, more importantly, I hope the, the, the video highlights the astronomy in this astrophotography hobby. And with that in mind, I have three more videos coming, all, sh all, all about images that I captured with this AstroTech telescope. Um, they'll be all nebulas. Uh, one will be Rosette, the other will be the Spider and the Fly, and then finally we'll, we'll take a look at the Iris Nebula. And then at the end of March, I will be benching the AstroTech 115EDT and deploying a premium telescope to the observatory. And this is the Stellar View SVX 90T. So I really look forward to the video series on that new telescope and doing some comparisons against our budget refractor versus our premium refractor. So if you're into astronomy and all things astrophotography, go ahead, subscribe. It doesn't hurt a bit. And you'll get notified as soon as I publish new content, which seems to be every week. So with that, I will see everybody on the next video.